All right, so welcome everybody today to ASL2 Extension. Um, we have Dr. Joy Rumble today, and she's gonna be talking about stakeholder identification and evaluation. Um, and she's from the ASL Department, Agricultural Communication, Education, and Leadership. So welcome. Um, thanks, we're appreciative of this partnership between Extension and ASL. Um, and we've been hosting these webinars since September of 2019, and they'll run through May of this year. And we've had a lot of uh, positive feedback and we'll have more of these um, sessions throughout the year. So feel free to look for the emails from Jared and go ahead and register. So without further ado, take it away. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Amanda. Were you going to say something, Beth? Yes. If, in your evaluation, if there's a topic that you're interested in, please add that. Um, Jared and I are starting to plan next year's, and so we love to have your feedback. So thank you for everybody for logging in this morning. Yeah, great. Thank you. Enjoy. All right. Well, thanks. I'm happy to be here today and talk to you guys about uh, the role of stakeholders in evaluation. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Get this going. Uh, a lot of times when we talk about evaluation, it's not a very exciting topic that people like to talk about. A lot of times you'll, uh, oh, let's switch that, hold on. Can you guys see it good? Yep, good now? Yes. All right, All right. so a lot of times when we talk about uh, stakeholders and evaluation, uh, people just think about evaluation being what they have to do for their report of accomplishments or, you know, TNP or just the things that they have to do for accountability. And evaluation can definitely be used for accountability, but it can be used for a lot more uh, than accountability. And it can actually be really beneficial to help us improve our programs over time, uh, which can be very beneficial um, at the individual level, the county level, the state level, and even uh, for additional funding and relationship building as well. And so, uh, I encourage you to keep your mind open as we talk about evaluation because uh, sometimes the things that we traditionally consider to be evaluation um, are just really the tip of the iceberg on, on what all evaluation can actually be. And I'm actually going to pop out of um, the presentation real quick and I have a, a poll here. Uh, so if you would all participate in this poll for me, <clears throat> that would be fabulous. Uh, so I, I want you to just respond to this question. Have you ever considered the role of stakeholders in your program evaluations that you do for your job? And so you can either text or you can go online and do this. Uh, if you do the text, you'll have to text and jump back onto it. You know, you always expect these things to be smooth <laughs> and then it doesn't always go smooth. But anyways, you're seeing the screen again, correct? Yes. All right, perfect. All right, so let's jump into it. So the objectives for today, uh, there was more listed in the description of the, the webinar and we are gonna hit on those, but I've included the two main ones here of describing the role of stakeholders in program evaluation, and then really uh, hopefully uh, helping you to identify and describe who your program stakeholders are for a program that you're utilizing in your job. And so if you want, go ahead and use the chat box now, or if you want to turn on your microphone, that's fine too. And uh, just talk to me a little bit about why we do program evaluation and extension. to the, improve the impact of programming, good. To improve programming. Accountability that we are serving the needs of our clientele, definitely. All right, good. And so when we think about those reasons that we do program evaluation, uh, we really want our evaluation to be useful and not just something that we, we you know, do a survey at the end of the program, report some numbers and then forget about it, right? We really want it to be useful. And part of uh, helping it to be useful can be um, engaging these stakeholders because it really allows us to be purposeful in our evaluation and it helps to ensure that our evaluation results will be used um, after the evaluation is focused or is completed. 
So who are our stakeholders? When we talk about stakeholders for program evaluation, it includes individuals, groups, or organizations that can affect or are affected by an evaluation process or its findings. And so I want you to consider that definition a little bit and think about it. Um, a lot of times when we think about stakeholders, we think about the same ones that we always use or the ones that we always call on. Uh, but I want to caution you, particularly in program evaluation, to think about uh, those stakeholders who um, might be affected by the results um, because those folks are sometimes forgotten. Uh, we might think specifically about, you know, maybe the people, the stakeholders that are funding the program, those who are organizing it, uh, those who are participating in it, in it. But, you know, the people that are affected by the program indirectly um, might have some big effects and they might be forgotten. And so I encourage you to think about who those might be. And so I have an example for you. Uh, if we had a after school program uh, that was coming under scrutiny because, um, you know, it really was costing a lot of money and they weren't showing that it was having a lot of uh, local benefit, perhaps, and the funders were really saying like, hey, we, we want to cut this program because it's just too costly and we can't support it anymore. And as maybe the program evaluator or the program organizer, you're thinking about the stakeholders and who all might be affected. Well, it's easy to think about, well, if I'm the organizer, I may not have this as part of my duties and responsibilities anymore, or these kids, um, you know, they won't have this after school program to go to anymore. Uh, but we have to really think about, well, what does that mean? If this program goes away and these kids don't have this to go to, what does that mean for their parents? What does that mean for the community where these kids are now you know, maybe they don't have anything productive to do with their time after school now. And what does that, what impact does that have on the community or those around them? And so I encourage you not to just think about those easy to identify first level stakeholders, but think a little bit deeper beyond that about those indirect effects as well. And when we talk about key stakeholders, uh, you know, there's going to be stakeholders that you identify that have competing interests. Uh, sometimes uh, the participants are going to have different interests um, than the funder. And so we have to be really careful when we think about these stakeholders and think about the influence that they have among and between each other as well. And uh, we're going to go through an activity here in a minute where we identify some of these stakeholders. And I'm going to encourage you to think about a long list of stakeholders, but we're also going to have to think about narrowing that list down into key stakeholders or primary primary um, intended users. Uh, and as we make those selections, we're going to have to really use some judgment and negotiation in the process. And so sometimes uh, this isn't just a sole job of the evaluator. Sometimes this includes a committee of stakeholder representatives uh, that might be um, helping to support the evaluation as well. And so sometimes you have to uh, negotiate among your team which stakeholders you want to be included as well. But even if you're operating as a sole evaluator, uh, you're still going to have to think about in your own mind uh, some judgments and negotiations to make sure that you select the right, right folks. Uh, and when we talk about those primary specific stakeholders, we're talking about those who are selected to work with the evaluator throughout the evaluation. And I think a lot of times we just think of stakeholders being those that we're going to give the results to. Uh, but really, stakeholders can be much more involved in the evaluation process. They can help with the design and the methods of your evaluation. They can help to interpret results. Uh, they can be engaged in helping to disseminate that evaluation information and making sure that it's used and that credibility is built among those who are going to be receiving it. And so that they can become very useful and they can help to alleviate some of the work that we often think about being incorporated into a good evaluation. And when we talk about those primary intended stakeholders or who we identify as our key stakeholders, we do want to try to select a, device, a diverse group of stakeholders uh, so that they can help us to transmit those findings to uh, a device, a div I cannot talk today, a diverse group of constituencies. All right, so if you're available and uh, able, I encourage you to get a sheet out a sheet of paper, but even if you're not able to get out a sheet of paper, that is okay. Um, I know if we're giving babies a bath, we may not be able to, and that's perfectly okay. Your time is better spent um, uh, doing that. 
uh, than getting out a sheet of paper right now. But uh, if you're able to, uh, get out a sheet of paper. If you're not, uh, just follow along maybe in your head and make some mental notes or uh, go back and watch the recording later and see, uh, see uh, if you can follow along and implement these steps for one of your own programs. And so we're going to walk through some steps of identifying stakeholders and identifying uh, how they should be engaged in our program. So I want you to think of a program that you use in your job, uh, one that you either currently evaluate or would like to evaluate. And I would want you to brainstorm a list of potential stakeholders. And remember, those stakeholders are people who are either directly or indirectly impacted uh, by the evaluation or by the program. Um, and uh, we'll have some guiding questions here in a second to help you think about that as well. So you can start scribbling down uh, a list of those potential stakeholders. And to help you form that list, I want you to think about who funds the program, if there's a funder or if there's donors. Uh, those would definitely be stakeholders. Uh, I want you to think about who's involved in the program delivery, who oversees the program, who attends or participates in the program, and then who is directly impacted by the program and who is indirectly impacted by the program. And so take a, take a minute or so to uh, work through each of those questions and list those, um, those stakeholders that fall under each of these questions if they're, if they're applicable to your program. And I forgot to mention, if you guys have questions throughout, please don't be afraid to interrupt me. Uh, I'm happy to take questions as we go. All right, so hopefully you've had a few moments to start listing some of those stakeholders out. And I'm gonna show you an example of some stakeholders that I've came up with for a program that I'm working on. Now, my program's a little bit different because I'm in an academic position, uh, but uh, one of my classes that I teach, I taught it for the first time this past fall, and I really um, felt it was important to evaluate that class because it was being taught the first time and I knew I would want to make improvements in the future, but also because it was a unique class in that um, I was teaching 10 students face to face here on the Worcester campus and at the same time we were video linked via Zoom to 30 students on the Columbus campus. And so that unique nature of the video linked class was really interesting to me and I wanted to see if the learning environment on the two campuses impacted uh, any of the students learning. And so I was interested in the evaluation from that standpoint as well. And so when I thought about my stakeholders and I asked myself these questions, uh, these are some of the folks that I came up with for, for my program or my class. And so uh, me as the instructor was definitely um, a stakeholder because I was directly involved. I was organizing the program. Uh, as well as my teaching assistants. And then I had um, students who were AgCom majors as well as students who were AgCom minors on both campuses. Those were my participants in the program. I had course designers that were helping me uh, to design the class. And so they had a direct interest and stake in the, in the program and those were involved stakeholders as well. Um, I would say IT was kind of one of those indirect stakeholders because they weren't directly involved in the program, but when things went wrong uh, or when Zoom wasn't working or the microphones in the class wasn't working, uh, we definitely called on them and we, we need their support to make sure that our program is functional. And sometimes when we think about the improvement, uh, it might be IT related on things that I need to fix to be able to improve the class. Uh, administration is also one of those stakeholders. So, um, you know, the, the college administration was uh, they did give me some funding for this class. I had a course development grant, so they were interested from that standpoint, but they're also interested in this format of classes and if the future of education could adopt this format more widely. And so they have a stake in it, and I think they'll have a huge say on what this class may or may not look like in the future. And then academic affairs, of course, supporting uh, not only enrollment in the classes, but also uh, this new class came about because of a major change. 
And so they were stakeholders, um, but then also other instructors because I need other instructors to encourage their students to take this class, particularly if they're in minors. Um, I also need support staff because uh, they help us secure classrooms and schedule things, get IT lined up, all of those things. And then also advisors um, who might be advising students in the major or minors and industry stakeholders. And so you might be saying, well, how are industry stakeholders um, stakeholders for a an intro to agricom class and i really think about them as those indirect stakeholders because if i'm not preparing my students well when they go out into industry uh, then they're not going to be able to do their job well and so i really think about those industry stakeholders as being people who could be indirectly impacted by the results of my class so I hope that this example helps you think about the breadth of stakeholders that might be included in your programs as well. And I'll show you, um, I'll show you the examples from my class as we go throughout these steps. And so the next step after you've listed all of those out is um, you can be, um, you can further flesh this out in your stakeholders by preparing a separate sheet for each stakeholders. And so again, if you have time to do this now, uh, maybe you just want to do it for one stakeholder. I'm going to show you an example for just one stakeholder. Um, but it's really encouraged that you do this for all stakeholders. And that is to prepare a separate sheet of of paper for each stakeholder or even just a table if you have lots of space left on your original sheet and you're going to split that sheet of paper into two columns on the left hand column you're going to brainstorm the stake or interest that each stakeholder has in your program and then in the right hand column you're going to brainstorm their stake or interest in your evaluation and you're going to list as many stakes or interests that each stakeholder might have and so um, for uh, for each stakeholder, you would have a table or a sheet of paper split into two columns where you're listing their stake or interest in the program and their stake or interest in the evaluation. And this is important to think about because really breaking this down will help you to identify uh, what their role may or may not be in your evaluation and how you might be able to engage them in your evaluation. And so this is what mine looked like. And so um, uh, for my example, for my Intro to Ag Comm class, I utilized me as the instructor. And so uh, if we're looking at the stake or interest in the program, you know, it's part of my job. So I have that interest in it. I enjoy the topic. I really want my students to learn and be successful. Uh, I put a lot of time into this. Uh, so that's also a stake that I have in it, but also teaching evaluations, which also impact how I'm evaluated in my professional role. Uh, but then when we look at the stake or interest in the evaluation, I've identified that, uh, you know, the, this class fulfills department needs. Uh, I want to understand how the format of the class impacts learning between the two campuses. I want to know if one group learned more than another. Uh, I want to know how students' experiences across the two campuses compared. And uh, I'm evaluated on the success of the class. So that's another reason why I'm interested in the evaluation. And I also want to know how to improve the class. And so this is an example of a table or a format that you could create for each stakeholder to kind of really flush out, uh, flush out their role in both the program as well as the evaluation. And you might be saying, you know, why is it necessary to list all of this out? And I think, uh, you know, something that I teach the program evaluation class at the grad level and sometimes uh, the students ask, man, just seems like this is a lot of steps or all these steps really necessary. And uh, the question or the answer is no, they're not always necessary. But if you go through each of them, especially your first time, uh, it really helps you to think through the processes and make good decisions to help uh, complete a, a strong evaluation with good stakeholder support. Uh, so I've included this uh, graphic here to demonstrate why I think it's important to consider the stake or interest in the program as well as the stake and interest in the evaluation for each of your stakeholders. And an example that I have for this is a grant that I am working on. And the grant um, includes a program evaluation and um, the, the PI of the grant uh, is very invested in the program, wants the program to be successful, like most PIs would, right? If we put all this effort into a grant, we really want it to be successful and to make changes. Um, however, the PI does not have as much investment or value in the evaluation of the grant. 
And uh, I understand that the PI really wants only good information to come out about the program because they want it to show that it's successful. Uh, but they're really starting to hinder the evaluation process and uh, to the point where they have even declined signing the consent form to participate in our evaluation of the grant. And uh, so they have, even though they should be a main stakeholder in our evaluation, uh, we're kind of coming to that point where we're saying we can't include them as a stakeholder in our evaluation because they don't want to participate. And so we have to really think about what stakeholders uh, how we can restructure that evaluation as well as what stakeholders we can utilize um, to help support the evaluation. And so this has been a, a challenging example of evaluation uh, when things don't go right in evaluation and with stakeholders. Uh, but I share that with you to demonstrate that, you know, you have to think carefully about your stakeholders and how we're using them. Uh, and it's really a shame in this particular instance because I think our program evaluation is really identifying a lot of ways that the grant could be improved and the project can continue to improve to have even greater impacts. And it's also revealing that there are some really strong and positive impacts, but without the participation of uh, we're kind of losing the ability to report on some of those impacts and uh, it's getting, um, it's, it's just frustrating because we can't share the whole story. And so I encourage you to think carefully about uh, those stakeholders and their stake and interest, not only in the program, but also in the evaluation because uh, it, you know, your strongest stakeholders are going to have um, positive interest in both. All right, so now that you have uh, listed all your stakeholders out and maybe thought through their stake in the program as well as their stake in the evaluation, I want you to start re-examining your stakeholder list. And one strategy to do this is to really think about um, using red, yellow, and green. And so if you ask yourself uh, three questions or three statements about each stakeholder group and uh, you know some readings even recommend if you have like a red and yellow marker or red or red yellow and green marker and then a red yellow and green dot you could put these um, you could put these on your sheet for each stakeholder group and so the first one would be how well do you think how well do they think the program is going to work so when I think about um, you know, for me as the instructor of my class, uh, if I'm kind of thinking through it as myself as a stakeholder, uh, I think the program is going to work. So I would put a green for that. Um, do I have any concerns with my involvement in my class? Uh, I mean, I can be hard on myself sometimes, but I still think I would probably put green, all right, for that. And then is there any concerns with my involvement in the evaluation? I would say no, because I'm invested with that. So I also put a green dot for that. And so uh, thinking through these things will help you as you start to narrow down your, li your list, which is our next step. If we go back to my example of that grant I was referring to, if I thought about um, that grant PI and uh, their lack of willingness to participate in the evaluation, um, I would, you know, the, I, they wouldn't be all green on this. And so if I thought, uh, how well does the PI think the program is w going to work? I would probably say they think it's going to work. They're going to put green. Uh, is there concerns with their involvement in the program? Uh, I'm probably going to put yellow or red because I feel like they aren't considering everything that they should with their involvement in the program. Um, and so I'm probably going to put yellow or red and be cautious with that. And then is there concerns with their involvement in the evaluation? Well, that's definitely going to get a red dot. And so um, it just creates a really nice visual for you as you start to compare all your stakeholders together. You can see where certain stakeholders might have concerns and where you might need to proceed with caution as you decide whether or not to include them as key stakeholders in your evaluation. All right, so the next step is to narrow down your stakeholder list. And so, uh, now we're going to start taking the huge list that we had and start narrowing it down. And there's three main things that uh, you can think about to help aid you in this process, but I also encourage you to utilize, uh, you know, the, the visuals of the red, yellow, and green that you would have created for each of those stakeholders. 
And so as you look at those visuals and ask yourself, um, some, work through some of these things, hopefully you'll be able to narrow down your list. And so I want you to think and discuss um, how each stakeholder influences the program and the evaluation, all right? And so you might realize that, you know, this stakeholder really influences the program and, and or if we don't have their buy-in, they could say that our evaluation is not useful and they could really hinder the dissemination of the results, right? They could get other people not to trust it. And so you might realize that I need to really work with the stakeholder, I need to include them and I need to figure out how to get them on board. Uh, and then the next thing to consider is decide what you need as an evaluator from each stakeholder. Do you need data from them? Do you need a good relationship from them so that they will just help to disseminate your results and help the results be useful? Do you need them to engage? Do you need them to help you make decisions as an evaluator? Or do you need them just to stay out of it and not be involved? And as I think about that grant, even though the PI is a really important person, we're at that point where we're like, we just need the PI to not be involved in the evaluation. And they made that decision themselves by not signing the consent form, but it's also um, something that we have had to consider as the evaluators. And then we go to the last one. Uh, and as you narrow down that list, you wanna make sure that you include those who have information that you can't get otherwise. And those who are integral to the successful evaluation process. And so, you know, this one is a hard one because as I think about my own example with that grant, um, I really uh, think that the PI has information that we can't gain otherwise. Uh, but because of the situation, we're not going to be able to utilize the PI uh, for the evaluation. So we've really actually had to shift some of our evaluation goals and objectives and focus on some other things that we hadn't originally planned on. And so um, that happens sometimes, but hopefully you're not in those tough situations and you can uh, readily include those who have the information that you need and those who are integral to your successful evaluation process. And so when I narrowed down my stakeholder list for my class, going back to my example of that intro to agriculture communication class, uh, you know, I had a, a, a huge list that included everything from the instructors to the TAs to the, you know, administrators, academic affairs, industry folks, and then other instructors and advisors, et cetera. And so when I really nar narrowed down that stakeholder list, I've identified that the, the four that I felt that at this point uh, fell into these three categories uh, or allowed me to say that I needed them uh, and also had favorable red, yellow, and green outcomes uh, as I evaluated each group. Uh, the four that I identified was uh, myself as the instructor, the course designers, students, and the administrators or academic affairs. And um, as we, we think about those, you know, my students had data that I can't get from anywhere else, right? And so that's why they were included. Um, administrators in academic affairs, they're really, they're really integral to the success and future of the program. And so I need their buy-in and I need them to be on board. Uh, I need them to believe in my evaluation results. If they don't find my evaluation to be credible, then I'm doing a lot of work for nothing, all right? And then when I think about my course designers, they're really important to help me identify additional ways that the course could be improved in the future. And then myself as the instructor, I need, I need to be in the know. And I also have some information that can't be gained otherwise. All right, so uh, the next step is to establish stakeholder roles. So once you've narrowed down your list, now you're gonna think critically about what role each stakeholder might um, play. And so the roles are kind of two level. First, we're gonna identify um, their role as far as, um, you know, what, what power or not they bring to uh, the evaluation, but then also what their engagement looks like. And so uh, evaluation literature talks about four main uh, roles of stakeholders, and these include the players, subjects, context setters, and the crowd. All right, and so when we talk about players, uh, that is really people with an interest and significant power um, in your evaluation. 
And those are people that have uh, are high potentials for primary users and who can affect your evaluation use. And so they are um, important folks. When we talk about subjects, those are people who might have an interest in your evaluation, but they have little power or oversight over it. Um, but they might be impacted by your program findings. Context setters, these are uh, people who have a lot of power but little direct interest, um, but we wanna keep them happy. So we're thinking, uh, you know, this is like your funders, your administrators, et cetera, right? So they have a lot of power, they could squash a program with a blink of an eye, um, but, you know, they're probably overseeing lots of things. And so their, their direct interest might be lower than some of our other roles of stakeholders. And then the crowd, when we talk about the crowd, we're talking about, uh, people with little interest or power, um, but that they might need to be informed about the evaluation. And so uh, when I think about crowd, this would be, um, you know, like my industry stakeholders. I haven't decided to select my industry stakeholders as a key stakeholder right now, uh, but that doesn't mean that they couldn't be key stakeholders later. And, um, and so, I, you know, if I did this evaluation again in a few years, uh, they might be a stakeholder that then becomes important because we're starting to see um, the students matriculate out into the career field. And so if I, if I continue to do this evaluation, then uh, that those folks might be an example of uh, stakeholders who would fall into the crowd role. And so hopefully my little icons uh, help you remember those, the playbook for the players, a uh, little face for the subjects. I use the lightning bolt for the context setters because I like to think that because they have lots of power, they can strike down a program if they, if they so choose. And then the crowd is just um, all of our little people. All right, so when I applied these four uh, major roles to my stakeholder groups or my key stakeholders that I identified, I identified the instructor and the course designers as both being players. Um, the instructor because, uh, you, you know, the instructor is going to uh, be able to tell us what has been done, but also is going to collect data. Our course designers, they're going to be able to assess course materials and collect data as well. And so if you go back to that, you remember uh, players are people with an interest and significant power. Uh, they're going to be the primary users and they can affect evaluation use. And so when I think about the instructor and the course designer, they both fall into those categories. Students, students are the ones that are going to be providing data. Um, and I have included them as subjects because, you know, they probably have interests because they're in the class, but they have little power. Uh, they might be impacted by the program findings, however, if I make significant changes to the class. And then administrators or slash academic affairs, uh, those are my folks that have a lot of power, um, but maybe a little direct interest, um, but I need them to be bought into the program and provide input to the process. And so they are my context setters. All right, so once you've established their roles, you can start to think about uh, their engagement and uh, planning the engagement for each of your stakeholders. And so uh, we'll look at this. I've had to split it up onto two screens because there's a, a lot of information. Uh, and I want to, as we look at the different ways that stakeholders can be engaged in program evaluation, I want you to, to keep an open mind because sometimes um, the engagement is things that we haven't considered before or things that are maybe uh, not typical to what we're used to. All right, so, and these gradually um, build and get to higher levels of engagement as we go on, all right? So the first type of engagement for a stakeholder would be do not engage. There's no promise that we're going to make to those stakeholders as an evaluator, and uh, there's no importance or usefulness to them being involved, all right? So that would be the lowest level, no engagement. This would be that PI for the grant that I discussed, all right? That's where we're at with that stakeholder. All right, the next level of engagement would be to engage a stakeholder as a data source. Uh, and so these would be like my students in my class, if we're in, or your participants in a program. If we are engaging uh, stakeholders as participants or data sources, um, we will promise to them as evaluators that we will, we will honor the human subject protocols and treat uh, the participants and data with respect. 
Um, now a question that usually comes up here is, do you have to collect IRB on evaluation studies or evaluation work? Uh, it's not a clear answer. Uh, I can tell you that if you ever plan to publish any of the results or share them widely, uh, it is best to have IRB approval. Uh, but I also know that IRB approval for every evaluation that you conduct at the end of an extension program is not always realistic as well. And so that's a conversation that I would encourage you to have um, among extension uh, in uh, the Ohio State system. Um, I am not up to date with what that conversation looks like um, with Ohio State's extension, uh, but at my previous institution, um, they were at the point where they were pushing all um, extension agents and extension faculty to seek IRB approval on all of their evaluations. Um, and I'm not sure if we're there um, here at Ohio State, but that's something for you to consider and talk to uh, your supervisors about. Um, and then as we talk about engaging them as data sources, we also are going to talk to them about the importance and usefulness of their data and that they'll really be providing needed data. All right, so the next step up from that for type of involvement is to inform. And so, uh, you know, maybe they're not providing data, but we are going to promise to them that we're going to keep them informed of the evaluation's progress and findings. Uh, this type of engagement can be really powerful for building relationships and establishing trust. And uh, the importance or usefulness of keeping a stakeholder informed or having them be engaged at the informed level uh, would be that so, they, so that they can disseminate findings and create interest in the results once the evaluation is complete. Uh, the next level of engagement is to consult. And so uh, at this level, you're really starting to uh, consider those stakeholders as an integral piece of excuse me, the evaluation process. And so as an evaluator, you're promising that you will keep that stakeholder informed, um, that you will listen to them, and that you will, um, and that they will be able to provide feedback on how, um, on how the evaluation is going, but you'll also provide them feedback on how you utilize their um, input in the evaluation. And so it's really treating this as like a two-way street as you're working as a team together and uh, they're able to consult on the direction of the evaluation. And the importance of this type of engagement among stakeholders is that they're able to help you as an evaluator um, anticipate issues that you might encounter along the way. So, you know, if we had a consultant on that grant that might have been able to say, you might have issues uh, with this one stakeholder, uh, that could have been really beneficial. We didn't have it in that case, but uh, a consulting type of engagement by a stakeholder might be able to do those types of things where they can anticipate issues or identify landmines that you might encounter. Uh, they might also be able to suggest priorities or enhance the credibility of your evaluation. Uh, the next level of engagement is to involve. And so when we have stakeholders who are directly involved with their engagement, um, we are, um, they're working with us to ensure, um, uh, we are working with them to ensure that their concerns are considered and reflected um, in the options that we pursue through our evaluations. We're making sure that they get to review and comment on options. And uh, we're making sure that we're telling them how we made changes based on their input. And so uh, this is uh, really just deepening that level of consulting a little bit deeper and letting them uh, really have that direct influence. And here the importance is, is that we're affirming the importance or the appropriateness um, of their input and they're really adding utility to the evaluation and it helps to establish um, credibility and help the results to be attractive um, at the end. The next level is collaboration. So when we seek a collaborative level of engagement, uh, this is the promise of the evaluator uh, to incorporate their advice and suggestions to the greatest extent possible. So here we're giving more reins of the evaluation over to the stakeholders. Um, and you're really telling them that they are meaningful to the process and that they are part of the decision-making process. 
Um, they are really serving as the primary intended users of the evaluation because of their high interest and their availability and their influence on the evaluation. Um, and they're really uh, starting to develop a sense of ownership over the evaluation. The last level is the empowerment level of engagement. And this is um, where you're saying, this is your evaluation. That's what you're telling the stakeholders. You're offering them options and giving them information to help them inform the decisions. Uh, you're helping them decide and supporting them. Uh, but really, it is that stakeholder making the decisions. Uh, and so you're really developing capacity at this point. Um, you're using the evaluation to help build that stakeholder's capacity to engage in evaluative thinking and practice. And so if you think about that, that can be uh, a strategic tool that you could utilize, especially in a, a mentorship system, perhaps, uh, to help alleviate some of your evaluation uh, time burdens at some point. All right, so those were the major steps to help you to identify the stakeholders, their roles, uh, and their engagement in uh, your program evaluation. And so I hope that's been helpful to help you think about how you might be able to utilize uh, different stakeholders in your program evaluations. Uh, some other things that I want you to be cognizant of or think about is um, the culture of your stakeholders. And it's really important to think about the culture of your stakeholders because, you know, part of making sure these relationships work well between the evaluator and stakeholders is making sure that you know that audience and that you're not unintentionally offending them or um, not doing anything that might impede that trust. And understanding the culture uh, can be one of the first steps. Uh, also, I really encourage you to think about those relationships between and among stakeholders. Uh, because if you have two stakeholders that um, have diverging opinions on a particular issue or really on opposite ends of the spectrum, you're probably going to need to do a little bit more work as an evaluator to get them on the same page. And that can be a challenge and that's something uh, that you would have to use some conflict resolution uh, skills through to help get them on the same page. I also encourage you to keep an open mind and not be committed or tied to your stakeholders because your stakeholders might change. Just as the example I showed you with my grant or discussed with you about my grant, uh, we thought we were gonna have RPI be a stakeholder, but that has really, really changed. And so we've had to um, restructure that evaluation as well. In addition to that, the relationships that you have within and among your stakeholders um, might change as well. And so you will have to, to flex with that and stay on top of those relationships and any developing conflicts or uh, relationship changes that might emerge. And so to wrap it up, I really wanna talk a little bit about uh, stakeholders and extension evaluation. And so when I think about the use of stakeholders and extension, I really see the opportunity for stakeholders to really help us elevate our program improvement and really pay attention to our evaluation results, not just to report for accountability, uh, but to really help us identify ways that we can make our programs stronger. I think there's also a real opportunity to, to utilize evaluation and stakeholders in evaluation to really uh, draw on that key message that the Dean keeps talking about with permeable borders. By engaging our stakeholders, uh, it really is gonna help to develop relationships, but it's also gonna help to uh, uh, get them to see uh, the results of our programs and the impacts of our programs and to understand what work we are doing. Likewise, by having a closer relationship with them, we'll, we'll better understand where they're coming from as well. Um, I think with this engagement, uh, there also comes the opportunity through these permeable borders for um, more relationships to develop into potential funding opportunities. Because if they are integrally involved in, evalu in the evaluations and they see what impacts our programs are having, they might be more inclined uh, to, to be open to funding options as well. Uh, I think by also incorporating stakeholders in extension evaluation, it can take some of the burden and some of the work off of uh, the program evaluator. Of course, you have to make sure that your stakeholders are on board and trained and you still have to do a lot of relationship building work. Um, but if this is something that is a continuous process, uh, I believe that it, it will pay off and eventually 
um, it will help release some of that burden of that evaluation work. Um, and some things that I've observed from the, the students in my program evaluation classes, they're just like, well, this is just going to take way too much time. I barely have time to throw together a survey to give up my, at the end of my program. How can I think about doing all these other steps, like thinking about in depth about the stakeholder involvement? And uh, I recognize that we all have lots of burdens on our time. Uh, and my recommendation is to make small changes. Maybe you start by just improving the engagement with one stakeholder in your program evaluation and do it piece by piece and also starting with just one program you know maybe it's not you're not incorporating uh this uh larger stakeholder engagement with all of your program evaluations maybe it's just one to start and see how it goes and maybe it's one just just one stakeholder group at the start just making small changes and doing it uh piece by piece and then also um, uh, my, my recommendation that I have made to my class as well is really start thinking about program evaluation, not as an afterthought, but as part of the program planning process. When we take the time to really think about program evaluation during program planning, uh, it no longer becomes such a time suck because we've always had it included as part of the plan and it's not an add-on. And so if we can think about program plan or program evaluation during the program planning process, we can also think about how we will incorporate those stakeholders in the evaluation, but also in the program. And I think a lot of benefits um, will be seen if we do that uh, from the start. And so in summary, uh, things that we've talked about today is, um, you know, really engaging those stakeholders can help you to increase the usefulness of your program evaluation. And that's uh, why it's important to engage stakeholders in your evaluation so that the results will be used um, and be meaningful. Uh, we also want to make, uh, we also know that stakeholders um, can include those who are directly impacted and indirectly impacted. And I include that because I think it's important to remember uh, those who might be indirectly impacted because sometimes the largest effects can be seen among that population. And then also remember, you don't have to include every stakeholder that you come up with, but really engage those primary stakeholders, uh, purposefully identify their role in your evaluation, and then utilize them to make your programs better. So with that, I'll take any questions. Amanda, there's a, a question in the chat box about uh, if the um, PowerPoint or the recording will be available to access later. I believe the answer is yes, but I don't know the details yeah. about that. Yep, I will go ahead and um, send out the evaluation along with the recording of today's webinar. And I think eventually, maybe sometime next week, it'll be posted on the LOD, the Learning and Organizational Development website. Um, so everyone will have access to go back. Um, and view the recording. And I'll go ahead, thanks everybody for attending. Thank you, Dr. Rumble, for presenting. You're I'll welcome. go ahead and um, put the link to the survey in the chat box. And I'll also put in a plug for her graduate level class, Evaluation <laughs> and Accountability, that I'm taking right now. Um, so if you want to learn more information about this, it's very in depth and there's a lot of information, but uh, it's been really good, really helpful to understand more about the evaluation process and stakeholders. So um, if you, does anyone have any final questions? All right, well, thanks everyone for joining today. Um, again, please fill out the survey um, and check out the recording and then also go to the ASL2 extension um, website for further information or email Jared with any questions for any um, series in the future. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Have a good day.